Thomas, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Joseph Ledoux. Professor Ledoux is a neuroscientist. He runs a lab at New York University, where he's a professor of neuroscience and has been doing research for many years now. He's also the author of a variety of popular science books. The newest one is called The Deep History of Ourselves, The Four Billion Year Story of How We Got Conscious Brains. I spoke with Dr. Ledoux about various topics he covers in that book, and he's researched over the years. We talked about what behavior is and how it's not limited to organisms with brains and muscles. We talked about different forms of behavior that exist in the simplest organisms, even single-celled organisms, all the way up to organisms like ourselves. We talked about the nature of cognition and emotion. What is cognition? What is emotion? And how are these things intertwined within the brain? And how do they differ between different kinds of organisms? How is the kind of conscious awareness that humans have similar to and different from the types of conscious states that other organisms might have. We talked about all of those things in a variety of different contexts. We talked about some of the early experiments Joe Ledoux did when he was a graduate student involving split brain patients. We talked about some of the research he did later in his career to do with memory and the idea that memory is not only consolidated when we transfer it from short term to long term, but reconsolidated. It's sort of changed and altered every time that we actually recall a memory and we tied memory and language and emotion and cognition together in ways that were really interesting. And if you're interested in the brain or brain evolution or how brains do what they do with respect to emotion and cognition, this will be a great episode to listen to. Professor Ledoux is one of the authorities on all of these subjects. So I had a lot of fun speaking with him. If you enjoy the content I'm putting out on this podcast, please do like, share, and subscribe. You can find a video version of the podcast on YouTube. You can find the audio version on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any other major podcast directory. You can also subscribe to my free weekly newsletter, mindandmatter.substack.com. You'll get updates about the podcast, other things I'm looking at in terms of research that's interesting, and other areas of science that intersect with what I discuss with the guests on the show. You'll also get access to some of the long-form science writing that I produce and put on that substack. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can make Mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Today's show is brought to you in part by Dosist, an all-natural cannabis company specializing in dose-controlled cannabis products made with plant-based ingredients. To learn more about Dosist, their products, and where they are available, please visit their website through the link in the episode description. And with that, here's my conversation with Professor Joseph Ledoux. Professor Joseph Ledoux, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Can you start off by just telling everyone who you are and what your scientific research focuses on? Yes, I'm uh, Joseph Ledoux. I'm a professor of neuroscience at New York University, and I've worked on problems about emotion and consciousness for, uh, I don't know, 40, 50 years, something like that, uh, 45 years. I haven't added it up. Yeah, so you've been doing this for a long time. Um, you're also an author, among other things. Your last book, which I, I read through recently, is called The Deep History of Ourselves, the four billion year story of how we got our conscious brains. And one question I'd like to start out with is you say early on in the book that 
you know, normally when we think about behavior and consciousness, we think about animals with brains, especially uh, the biggest and most sophisticated brains. But you write that behavior is a feature of all organisms, not just those with nervous systems and muscles. So what exactly is behavior in the most fundamental sense? It's a, the behavior is the ability to um, move around in the environment, to respond to the environment. Um, and this is, you know, when we talk about approach and avoidance in a human or a rat, we think of that as we're doing that for some psychological reason. We're approaching things that are useful to us and avoiding things that are uh, not so good for us. And uh, if we start looking at how far back in evolution that goes, what we find is it goes all the way back to the beginning of life. The earliest cells that ever lived some 3.5 billion years ago, or however long it was, had to be able to detect and respond to danger uh, by moving towards and away from things, uh, moving towards nutrients and away from um, harmful things. Um, and this is something that every organism really needs to do in one way or another. I mean, even if you take a, a tree, it's got to uh, extend its roots to places where there are nutrients and liquids. Uh, and it has to withdraw if the soil is uh, toxic in some way. So these are just parts of what it is to be a living thing. It has nothing to do. Um, it has nothing to do with psychology. It's just about being a living organism, uh, whether you're a single cell or a complex organism. You all have to. All cells have to do that fundamental thing of approach nutrients and avoid danger. Uh, withdraw from danger, but they also have to be able to incorporate uh, liquids or drink liquids in some way to balance their fluids and electrolytes. They have to thermoregulate and they have to reproduce with their species to continue. So these are just fundamental things that are important for the survival of the organism. They have nothing to do with psychology. Of course, if you are a psychological being like we are and like lots of uh, other mammals at least and other you know, we could question whether i i would question whether invertebrates are psychological beings but that would get us into a whole controversy i don't want to go into but you know certainly humans and other mammals are psychological beings in the sense that we do things uh with intention that we have goals and we try to approach those goals to solve our problems but that's a whole nother level above the sort of routine neurobiological level that allows you to survive if you're an animal or the basic biological requirements if you're not an, an animal but you're still so, a living thing and so you know if someone's interested in studying psychology and studying aspects of how the brain connects to the mind, why is it useful or perhaps even <clears throat> necessary to understand the behavior of even the simplest single-celled organisms? Well, but the, the importance of the single-cell organisms, at least for me and my interest in, in uh, animals that are close to us, like mammals and uh, primates and, and uh, humans, um, other humans, um, the important thing is that some behaviors or um, uh, have nothing to do with psychology. And we can, get, you know, we can talk about a simple kind of classification. So you have reflexes. Now we're talking about animals. You have reflexes where they can detect uh, something sharp or hot and withdraw from it uh, or blink their eyes if, uh, if something goes into it. So that's a low, very low level of behavioral responding that doesn't require any, you know, quote, psychological involvement. The next level up would be fixed action patterns, things that the uh, ethologist made famous in the 1940s and 50s, um, these kind of instinctual uh, behaviors that um, most organisms have some form of that uh, helps them survive. Um, again, these are automatic responses to the environment and, and not things that are necessarily, quote, psychological. At a slightly higher level are instrumental responses that have been learned through trial and error. An instrumental response is a response that you learn to do because it has some benefit or consequence to it. Um, but in most animals, instrumental responses are of the trial and error habitual type. In other words, once you learn it on the basis of the reinforcer, uh, if you've repeated it a few times, enough times, it becomes a habit. And so the habit is then uh, um, uh, expressed automatically. So again, we're talking about a behavior 
that you might say, well, there was some psychology involved in the learning, but that's even that is dubious because habits are learned um, on the basis of reinforcement. Um, but let me backtrack one step and go back to these, um, the, these innate reflexes and fixed action patterns, because there's a, a version of those that uh, falls between um, uh, or below habits. And that version is Pavlovian conditioned responses. So bacteria, protozoa, all organisms seem to be capable, um, many organisms, I'll say, I don't want to make it too bold, many organisms, single cell and multi-cell are capable of undergoing Pavlovian conditioning. And that's where you have some stimulus that's presented and it has some meaningful consequence to the organism, uh, whether it's uh, the induction of some kind of tissue damage, uh, as with, say, let's say you have a, a rat and you give it an electric shock in the presence of a tome, there's a potential there of tissue damage, which uh, the shock sends to the brain. And that gets paired with the tone so that the tone now elicits uh, a, a defensive response like behavior. Um, but um, um, the... Um, uh, and, and you can do this with also with with uh, positive or repetitive stimuli. You know, a, food, a stimulus paired with food will lead to approach to the uh, the stimulus. It's interesting though that the aversive stimuli produce one trial learning, but it's very hard to get one trial learning to a kind of repetitive, positive, mm. uh, re rewarding, reinforcing stimulus. Uh, and that's very interesting. And I think it's because things that are dangerous and harmful have to be responded to immediately. You can put off the good stuff in life, you know, um, eating, drinking, sex. You, you, know, you don't have to have that every uh, time there's a stimulus that's relevant. Um, but you do have to respond to danger every time there's a stimulus that's relevant. And I think that's why the, you get that association there between repetitive and aversive uh, Pavlovian condition responses. So reflex is undergo Pavlovian conditioning and fixed action patterns undergo Pavlovian conditioning. So when a rat freezes in the presence of a tone that's been paired with a shock, that's an innate fixed uh, action pattern that the animal has the ability to do to a natural stimulus, but that can also be changed through Pavlovian conditioning. So that is a very fundamental and simple kind of learning that adds to the, to the, the range of use of these innate responses. But now we go back to habits. Habits are a different thing because it, with a habit, you're learning a new response. Uh, it's a response that you didn't have in your repertoire, but because the response is reinforced, it gets added to your repertoire. Uh, now, this is a problem of uh, trial and error learning. It's about how a reinforcer changes behavior. Now, there could be in the presence of an aversive stimulus, some, quote, fear, and in the presence of an, an appetitive stimulus, a positive stimulus, there could be some pleasure when the reinforcer occurs. But one of the problems we've had in psychology is the confusion of these subjective states with these um, um, basic responses that don't require there be a subjective state. It's not that we don't feel, you know, pleasure when we have a, a nice tasty meal or having sex or that we don't feel fear when we are in danger because we do obviously we do um, but when we project those emotions that we obviously know and feel onto other animals we're confusing the history of our survival behaviors with um, emotions emotions are something that is quite different and you may want to wait to get into that later in the discussion but i thought i'd just bring that up so let me just finish this hierarchy because after the the habits we have instrumental uh responses that are goal directed these depend on the creation of a middle model an internal representation of the organism in the world and, and that relationship and when that comes into play that is quite different from a habitual response very elegant research by Tony Dickinson and, and uh, Bernard Berlin um, at Cambridge. They were both there at the time and uh, showed that the, uh, the animal has to, um, that the, the difference between a habit and a um, uh, uh, goal-directed action is that one involves the representation of information independent of the external stimulus. And that is a special kind of quality. 
uh, that that some mammals have. And my take on this is that birds and mammals have it, but other animals don't have it. They have habits. Um, now, it's interesting to ask why birds and mammals have it and other animals don't. What's, what is it about birds and mammals? Well, they're both warm-blooded. And if you're warm-blooded, you have to generate a lot of energy to keep that warm bloodedness going to, you know, to, you got to have the, the, the fuel to, to uh, have that, that uh, warm bloodedness. You got to create heat in the body and you have to uh, consume food to do that fuel. Um, and that's a very energetic kind of process. You know, it's very demanding. The organism has to be able to know when to go searching for food, where it's likely to find it, what the consequences might be of going to this spot versus that spot. Is it the right time of year for that kind of food? Is it the right time of day for the predators and so forth? It's a lot of planning that's required to maintain that body heat. Birds and mammals seem to have this ability to create these internal representation, these models uh, that allow them to plan. And that may be a, a, a sort of side effect of being warm blooded, which is a fascinating idea that I read about recently. Hmm. So, there are these different kinds of behaviors. Some of them require a nervous system. Some of them do not. So simple Pavlovian conditioning is something that doesn't actually require a nervous system because animals without neurons are capable of doing it. So if we think about the simplest nervous systems, when the nervous system first evolved or the most primitive organisms with nervous systems alive today, what are their nervous systems doing and not doing compared to more complex creatures like ourselves? Well, so the, the simplest kind of uh, the earliest uh, animal that we know that's alive today uh, is a sponge. I mean, sponges don't even look like animals or so, you know, they're just kind of, and they don't move. So they're hardly uh, animals. They move a little bit. They kind of like can make very small movements over very long periods of time. They're more like a plant in a sense. But one possibility is that sponges once had a nervous system and then gave it up because they were able to uh, create a sessile life that allowed them to do what they needed to do to survive. Um, or it's also possible that they never had it uh, and that nervous systems first appeared in the next group of animals, which is the group that contains jellyfish and hydra and so forth. So these organisms have um, what's called a uh, diffuse nerve net. Uh, it's just a bunch of neurons that are interconnected. It's kind of like, a, you know, a, a a neural net in a computer program. It's just a bunch of neurons that are connected. Um, but all other um, uh, groups of animals after these jellyfish-like organisms, um, animals that are called mesozoans, uh, they are bilateral animals. They have a front, a back, a left, a right, and a top and a bottom, whereas jellyfish just have a top and a bottom. Um, animals that have all those different parts and the ability to move in different directions and to be able to you know do things in the front and the back have to have a more complicated kind of control if you touch a jellyfish anywhere on its body it produces a generalized kind of response but if you touch uh, an animal in a certain place you get a response usually of that place for example uh you you um the, the hand withdraws, the whole body doesn't withdraw necessarily. So nervous systems allow very precise control of the inputs coming in and the outputs going out of the nervous system. And a jellyfish is just all a big mush of things interconnected. So, I mean, that's probably an oversimplification about the poor jellyfish, but uh, the, there is a quite, quite a difference between having a central nervous system that can exercise top-down control over the body as opposed to a nervous system that simply can respond to stimuli that occur. So um, that's the, the main difference between a, a nervous system in these lower animals and nervous systems in, in animals that have bilateral bodies. So in a bilateral body, the brain is in the front. Uh, why is it in the front? Well, that's the, the, if, if you have a front um, and all of the sensory organs, most of the sensory organs are located there. It's a short distance to the brain. So all of that can be coordinated and then you can get the signals back to the body to make the kinds of movements that are necessary. Um, um, but having the brain in the front and that being the forward direction of locomotion means that something coming at you from behind might bite off your tail, uh, but at least you're going to still have your brain and your ability to control the body uh, in a, a reasonable, you know, kind of predictive way of uh, the, the environment. 
So um, you write in the book, and it sort of gets at what you're just saying, that the nervous system in the most fundamental sense is a sensory motor integration device. So whether it's a jellyfish or a human or something in between, there's, there's something fundamental about sensory motor integration, coordinating the inputs coming into the sense organs with the outputs being what the muscles are doing. Right. And much of our brain is devoted to you know, this, this process as well, detecting stimuli and responding to them. I mean, the most basic level of the nervous system, the reflexes, you know, that's sensory motor organization. Um, these fixed action patterns, those are often uh, motor programs that have been instituted by evolution. So that, you know, there's some, some stimulus in the environment that was dangerous to uh, the ancestors of an organism. And that kind of stimulus information then is automatically programmed to elicit those kinds of responses. Um, above that are these uh, Pavlovian, these learned responses, conditioned responses and habits. And then we get more into the goal-directed kinds of uh, uh, model-based behaviors. So yeah, there's um, there's lots of different ways of controlling, and you have to have a central nervous system to exercise the right kind of control over the right kind of response. But most of our brain is doing the, the basic kind of kind of stuff. Uh, you know, in a way, you could think of the brain, the human brain, as being composed of billions of of uh, uh, learning program cells that, that each cell has the ability to learn. Um, and we don't always know about that learning, but we, the, the, our, our cells, just as we are adapting to the environment, the cells in our brain are adapting to the changes that are happening in its, in their environment. So they don't know the outside world. They just know the inputs from other neurons. Uh, and that's their, their little local world. So each neuron has some inputs and it has some outputs. And as those inputs and outputs change, those neurons uh, change their characteristic. So throughout our brain, all of those neurons are acquiring information all the time, usually as part of, you know, more complex systems. Um, but even, the, the various uh, circuits and uh, synapses and systems that, that we have are made up of all these little cells or cells that are connected together or cells that are even more connected together in larger, larger schemes. Um, but our brain is, is, I think, in the most fundamental sense, acquiring all that information all the time. It's kind of like a deep learning system, and it's kind of a pop psychology kind of thing now, but our brain is a deep learning system that is accumulating information constantly. And that's what allows us to, that, that low level under the surface kind of information is what allows us to know that uh, this is me that's here. I don't have to say that. I just know it because it feels right because I've accumulated all this stuff about what it feels like to be me. And that's true probably of, uh, of every animal that there's a kind of uh, certainly, uh, I mean, you know, I think that that, that core information has to be re-represented in a certain way in order to be experienced by the animal. But even if you can't experience it, you can have that kind of deep learning that is providing a kind of um, extensive uh, coordination of a, what we could call a global organismic state in an organism that coordinates all of its activities or contributes to the coordination of those activities and makes it an organism. It allows it to be a unit that can do things all at once. Yeah, I'd like to talk about this idea of you know uh, an organism as a unit. Um, when we think about multicellular organisms, right? We, we've we're thinking about an organism with many different individual cells, many different kinds of cells that do different kinds of things. And you, and you wrote early on in the book that as animals became more complex and started consisting of multiple cell types organized into systems, new challenges were faced in maintaining the integrity of the organism as a self-sustaining unit in which the parts sacrifice their individuality to maintain the physiological viability of the whole. And you said that the nervous system is the solution to this kind of problem. So can you sort of expand on that, the sort of game theoretic idea of different cell types having on the one hand, some kind of individual self-interest, but then having to sacrifice that for the, the sake of the whole unit? Yeah. So um, the, the way to think about this is to go back to single cell protozoa. Uh, these organisms can form colonies. So each individual protozoa is an, an, a unit on its own. It will survive just fine on its own. But uh, what one of the things that happened when the protozoa arrived about uh, uh, 2 billion 
years ago in response to um, a, as a kind of you know, they evolved out of bacteria and other kinds of um, what's called prokaryotes you, uh, protozoa or eukaryotes and one of the things that happened is they unlike the bacteria and other uh, prokaryotes eukaryotes are able to grow a little bigger uh, because of their the fundamental way biological mechanisms that that uh, constituted their nervous system uh, and their the fact that they had a nucleus that was uh, contained within a membrane and uh, uh, organelles in the body, such as mitochondria, they were able to grow bodies slightly bigger than bacteria. Bacteria have a, a fundamental limit. They can never get very big, but eukaryotic single cells got a little bigger, not, like, you know, not twice or three times as big, but just big enough that they could then become predators to bacteria uh, and then predators to themselves. So there were two other protozoa. So uh, protozoa, the, or the, not protozoa, but protist in general, the, the group that the protozoa belonged to uh, were the first predators. Um, and this means that if you are a little smaller than some of the other organisms, it pays to kind of bound to get bind yourself together with other ones to uh, to get safety in numbers. So if you make yourself bigger as a group, uh, that protects you from single cell uh, organisms that are bigger than you as an individual coming to attack you. Um, and so in these groups, these are all these are all, for example, cells that come from different parental lineages there by the way uh, protozoa uh, the protist invented sex that's the, they, the first organisms that had sexual reproduction so we can say that the mother cell of all these cells in a colony isn't necessarily the same often the mother cells are different and the so-called daughter cells are collected together just because they're around and they can fuse together and so when they do that through gene uh, interactions amongst the cells that are clinging together, what you find is that you get these um, uh, uh, temporary or these inhibitory effects of all these cells together and their genes, where you get gene suppression in, in some cells for some functions. Remember, each cell can do everything, feed, reproduce, locomote, so forth. But in a colony, each cell gets a job. That's just randomly determined by the kind of algorithm that the, ge the genetic uh, pro um, the consequent, the protein consequences of the genes are spewing out and causing, you know, the suppression of some genes and the leaving of others alone. So you get some that are going to be involved in locomotion. Some are going to be involved in feeding. Some are going to be involved in fluid uh, extraction. Some are going to be involved in reproduction. Um, <clears throat> and when that happens, you get a kind of an efficient thing that is very close to being a true organism. But if one of those cells defects and decides to, doesn't decide, but just for whatever reason, maybe it gets bumped out or something. Uh, but if it is out in the water alone, it can it has all of those capacities because the suppressing genes are gone and it just reverts back to having everything. Um, but what happened with multicellular organisms is that a way was figured out evolutionarily to have those organisms all come from one mother, one uh, parent cell, uh, and have the same genome. And the when you do that, you can now start from a single cell, a fertilized egg, and create the entire body. How that happens is very complicated. I'm not a biologist. I'm not going to go into the details. But that's the key thing, that in a colony, um, <clears throat> each cell has the ability to do everything, but some of the functions are inhibited. But in a real multicellular organism, each cell only has its primary functions, right? Um, so um, it's the, the way that started was by a special kind of colony called a clonal colony. In other words, each cell was kind of a clone of the other. And so they had all the same genes and um, those clonal colonies were responsible for the evolution of plants, fungi, and animals, the three multicellular kingdoms of life. Um, <clears throat> because of, you know, once you had these clonal colonies, that was enough for evolution to take over and to figure out a way to put all of that into 
one cell that would then uh, create all the parts that did all the different functions. I see. So, so a, a key a key step in the evolution of multicellularity must have involved what well, you needed to have this one cell that gave rise to many, but in order for all of that coordination to happen and that specialization to happen, A, there has to be a way for the cells to literally stick together. And B, there needs to be some kind of communication between them so that one can learn that, oh, I need to turn on this set of genes, but not that set of genes, and then start to get specialization. Right. Yeah. Now, um, um, Something you said triggered something that I forgot exactly what it was, but uh, uh, it was a word. I, it, maybe we'll come back to it. Let's go on. Yeah. So, so when we start, you know, when we start thinking about these early nervous systems, we think about. Um, you mentioned the sponges and the cnidarians. So the cnidarians, like jellyfish, have this very simple neural net. They don't have a centralized brain like like animals do, and the sponges don't have a nervous system either because they never had one or maybe they lost it. But one thing that I found um, interesting to, to learn about and think about was they nonetheless have many of the genes required to make a simple nervous system. And so when we think about organisms that have genes that they don't use for, for some of these other purposes, or they don't use at the particular time in their development, what does that start to tell us about how we think about how evolution is actually piecing these novel structures together? Yeah, but I think we have to come at it from the different from a different angle because it's not that evolution isn't using these neural possibilities. The neural possibilities didn't exist, right? So l- let me tell the story of why why I wrote the book, if that's okay. Okay. Um, so I'd been working on Pavlovian conditioning in the mammal brain for uh, quite some time, number of years, 20 years or so, maybe longer. Um, and I had, you, I had you know, found out a lot about the neural circuitry involving the amygdala and other parts of the brain that connect the stimulus to the response and so forth. And then I turned to the molecular mechanisms that might underlie this kind of plasticity. And, you know, it's very hard to like from scratch, figure out how to study molecules in the mammalian brain, or at least it was at that point. But the invertebrate research by Eric Kandel and others had shown all these molecules that were involved. So we decided to just follow their lead and start studying the same molecules. I mean, this was being done in the hippocampus as well for like long-term potentiation and plasticity there. So it wasn't, I didn't invent this idea, but you know, the field was like moving in this direction. Let's use the hints from the invertebrates. And so you know, it was cool that they, okay, we can take something from an invertebrate, study it in a vertebrate, and show that it's not only involved in synaptic plasticity induced artificially by long-term potentiation, which is a kind of, you know, stimulation method, but also the same molecules and genes were involved in, in uh, actual learning by the animal, the Pavlovian conditioning. So, I didn't think, you know, I thought that was just very convenient methodologically. Uh, but then I spent some time with uh, Seth Grant, who had been a postdoc with Eric Kendall. Um, but at the time we were, uh, I was uh, doing a sabbatical at Cambridge, which where, where Seth was at the time. And we, um, you know, we're talking about this a lot. And what came to me from his, from his work was that these same, some of these same genes, let's take NMDA receptors, which are so important in synaptic plasticity in mammals. And look at where the, how far back in evolution those go. So, you know, what Seth found was, okay, you've got it, in, you've got certain components of the receptor in mammals. You've got uh, the same components in, you know, vertebrates, uh, other vertebrates, but you also have them in um, non-vertebrate organisms, invertebrates, of course, like the candel organisms, uh, aplesia and so forth, and worms and flies and bugs, um, but also in the jellyfish. Okay. So, okay, they all have nervous systems, so maybe there's something there. But also in sponges. Sponges don't have a nervous system. Mm. What are they doing with components of the NMDA receptor, which is so important for plasticity? Well, maybe that's the wrong way to talk about the NMDA receptor. Because you have something in evolution that's there for some purpose in sponges and in the protozoa ancestors of sponges within these NMDA receptor components that's there for some purpose. But now you're going to evolve, you're starting to evolve, you know, bodies that get more complex and you get some cells that interconnect locally and then they start growing and then you get a, a kind of uh, diffuse nervous system and then you get a centralized nervous system. All this starts 
from some kind of thing that exists in the non-animal organisms, non, uh, sorry, the non, yeah, the non-animal uh, protozoa. So they, you know, you got the same receptor components in uh, in trees and other plants and so forth. So there's something in back there in evolution that these components were used for. But now when you're moving towards trying to make behavior more complicated because, you know, the environment is changing, you have predators and so forth, you've got to respond in a new way. Along comes the ability to use whatever was in these um, uh, uh, other organisms in a new way. And that's what happens. Evolution takes what exists and builds up. So I, I think, yeah, so I wanted to uh, go back to what you said earlier that I couldn't remember them. You said they kind of stick together. And that's really important because the reason those uh, colonies stick together is because they have these cell adhesion molecules. Now, that the cell adhesion molecules continue to be used when you go from single cell to multi-cell organisms uh, as part of the mechanism of structural plasticity in the nervous system. The neurons have the synapse has to cling together, the front and the back of the synapse, the pre and the postsynaptic neuron have to cling together. And so these uh, cell adhesion molecules are allowing those synapses to maintain, to stay close together, and ultimately uh, initiate growth processes that allow them to be stabilized. So, you know, all this stuff comes from somewhere. It doesn't get invented out of a uh, whole cloth. It's all modifications of stuff that existed way back in many ways, in many cases. Mm, yeah. So most of the components of the things in the nervous system that we typically associate with, with nervous system stuff and brain stuff have usually have deep histories where they were used for some other purpose and they get kind of co-opted and retooled exactly. for new uses. Yeah. And a great example is the action potential. You know, you know, we think of that as the brain's like signaling mechanism, but the heart has action potentials too. Mm. It's not just the brain. There's action potentials all over the place. Um, and where did that come from? Well, it's believed that like this electrical signaling cells is believed to have occurred way back in evolution as a way of um, um, uh, per, close, you have a single cell organism. There's some damage to the cell wall, so that cell is going to die very soon because it will leak everything out. But evolution, uh, you know, Mother Nature, whoever we want to attribute this to, figured out that if you um, uh, create an electrical spark by certain kind of chemical interactions, uh, that will seal up the cell membrane. And so that electrical spark of protecting the integrity or restoring the integrity of an injured cell membrane became the basis for electrical signaling in single cell organisms internally for other purposes, you know, communication and for action potentials when nervous systems came along. So when we start to think about <clears throat> central nervous systems, animals with brains like vertebrates, you often hear in, in sort of pop size speak, this notion of the brain is containing, um, like two or three different parts. So you often hear people refer to the mammalian brain as having sort of a, a reptilian brain, an inner core that's responsible for basic reflexes and our, our baser instincts. And then there's this outer layer with the cortex and the expanded neocortex in mammals and primates that's responsible for thinking and cognition and the mind as we normally think about it. Is that a legitimate way to think about the brain or is that uh, confused in some important way? Well, the first you got something right that is not right in a lot of the pop psychology stuff, which is that this is all part of the forebrain, the mammalian forebrain, not three levels of the brain in general. I think you got that right. <laughs> um, so um, the you know the reptilian brain, people think of that as like the lowest part of the brain, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's the lowest part of the forebrain, and um, then the so you know in the in the this all comes from. Uh, a German neuroanatomist at the turn of the century, tw turn of the 20th century, uh, named, um, um, what's his name? <laughs> Ludwig. Ludwig, uh, yeah. I forget his last name. Anyway, but so um, he proposed that, the, uh, the, that we have these three brains. Um, and this was picked up on Paul, by Paul McLean. Let me just start that. I'm going to drop uh, uh, Ludwig out and just say, so 
all this three brain stuff um, in modern times comes from Paul McLean, um, a neuroscientist uh, who is at the National Institute of Mental Health in, in uh, the Washington area uh, in the 1940s and 50s. <clears throat> and during World War II, there'd been a lot of research on emotion before World War II, but during World War II, the whole research enterprise shut down. Um, then after World War II, things kind of like got rolling again. And that's when Paul McLean stepped in and he was looking back at the history of emotion research. And this led him to conclude that, you know, mammal, early mammals were nocturnal creatures um, um, based living their lives based on smell. That's correct. Um, and that, um, their brains were wired for this kind of primitive uh, uh, early response to um, um, uh, survival, right? So the idea was that the uh, mammalian brain, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm messing all this up. Let me start over. So after World War II, Paul McLean um, tried to integrate what had been started in terms of emotion research uh, before the war uh, and, and come up with a new explanation. <clears throat> and it's one. So after World War II, uh, Paul McLean tried to look back at the research that had been done on emotions uh, earlier. And um, he came up with a, uh, a a system that had been that was based on the earlier work of uh, Edinger in the early 20th century. And Edinger had come up with this idea of three kinds of brains stacked on top of each other, kind of reptilian brain uh, that controls instinctual behaviors, a uh, mammalian brain that controls uh, emotions, and a uh, higher brain, a primate or human brain that uh, has thoughts and, and controls behavior in a, in a rational kind of uh, way. And McLean picked up on this and turned this into a triune brain theory. And the triune brain theory uh, proposed these three levels stacked on top of each other uh, uh, with the, with the in the paper of the triune brain paper, I guess it was one of the, yeah, the, in his triune brain book, he said that the, the top part of this three-layered thing is the pinnacle of, of evolution, that we've reached the, the, you know, the peak of, of progress with our great uh, cerebral cortex. Um, and of course, that has been highly, highly challenged and, and discredited in modern research because uh, the key to this was that we had a, a reptilian brain um, a brain of that was like reptiles that started at was the earliest mammalian brain um, that was then added to on and on. Um, but research in the 1970s showed that the um, even reptiles have remnants of cortex. And the I'm really kind of blowing this whole thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, you know, keep going. I'm following. Yeah. You know, let me just can I pause for a second and gather my thoughts. Yeah, yeah, go for it. <clears throat> okay. So in this triune brain, the um, um, the reptilian brain was supposed to be taking care of instinctual behaviors, um, and this was. Uh, supposedly something um, that uh, was directly passed on from the reptiles. Um, and you, you ended up with uh, the basal ganglia uh, as a result. So in reptiles, the basal ganglia was said to, to occupy the entire forebrain. Uh, and in mammals, it only occupied a small part. Um, but in mammals, we also got something called a neobasal ganglia, a neostriatum that was supposed to be brand new. Now, it turns out that that neostriatum, based on modern neuroanatomy, actually exists in reptiles. Mm. Now, McLean also said that the mammalian brain, uh, what he called the limbic system, was a new mammalian addition. So just as the, uh, the, the, it's just as mammals got a new reptilian part of the brain, uh, or added a part to the reptilian brain, the neostriatum, um, the, uh, the mammals added a, a limbic system, uh, and that allowed you to have not only 
fixed action patterns or instincts, but also now emotions. Um, and because of this uh, 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 mammalian uh, limbic system. And then on top of that, um, but well, let's so, so the mammalian specialty, so the mammalian specialty, the limbic system was supposed to not be in reptiles, but areas of the mammalian limbic system, the amygdala, the hippocampus, uh, others, other areas like that, have been found in reptiles and have been found in verte lower vertebrates, fish, early fish. So the point is, well, then let's go into the cortex. So the third part, the neocortex, um, was supposed to only be in, in uh, primates, but it's present in, in uh, rats, but it's also present in birds and reptiles. It's also present in for, um, uh, lower fish. So it, nothing is really new. It's all modifications. There aren't things that were stacked on top of each other. What happened is structures became entwined and, and evolved. Like this part of the basal ganglia expanded to have a, a novel part. This part of the um, um, middle part, what he called the limbic system, expanded so that the amygdala got bigger and more connected. But it was always there, even in early fish. Um, and the cortex also Remnants of, cort of cerebral cortex, neocortex in, in ver uh, reptiles. There's cortex pallium in, in uh, fish. So everything has, was there from the beginning of the vertebrate brain. It's just a matter of degree. And it was, you know, as it changed, it evolved and became bigger. And it looked like you know, there were some like, major significant changes, but it's all based on something that was already there. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned how everything is so intertwined, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about the difference between emotion and cognition, because you know people often talk about those things as if they're completely separate. One part of the brain is doing emotion and basic feelings and basic instincts, and other parts of the brain are doing cognition, but to what extent are these things intertwined and inseparable? Well, let's start with the definition of cognition. Um, and I'm giving you my definition, which not everyone will accept, but this is the framework from which I'm um, working and you're talking to me. So I'll tell you what my framework is. So I think of cognition as uh, the ability to create internal representations of the world and use those representations when the stimulus in the world that was responsible for those representations is not present. So it's the ability to draw upon memory to uh, construct a model of the world in which you can examine different possibilities of action or um, different possible ways of thinking uh, without having to test it out. So if you are a, <clears throat> if you are an animal that only has uh, the ability to undergo trial and error learning, you're going to have to try that trial and error is going to have to occur in the world. And if it's a dangerous situation, you're going to have to risk your life to learn what's safe and what's not. Um, but if you are a more complex animal that has uh, the ability to create these mental models, then you can simulate the trial and error, you know, you know, a quick flash, uh, decide what to do on the basis of, you know, what's going to happen if I do this, what's happening that. Not literally talking about it like that, but, you know, the mental models are able to use that information and, and uh, and respond to the world in a more advanced way than you can with just uh, trial and error learning. Now, in the human brain, we can do this like in a, literally in a flash of a second, evaluate options um, because the human brain is able to simultaneously um, think of alternatives while working on a problem. Other primates seem to have to stop working on the problem in order to consider alternatives. And then they can go back to the problem if the alternatives aren't better, but if one's better, then they can go. Whereas other mammals have to, um, um, even if they have some kind of ability to create mental models, which they do, I, I've got to just stop this from doing it. So. Other mammals have the ability to create mental models, um, but they don't have the ability to pause and evaluate. Mm -hmm. If they Go to, to if they go to testing mental models mentally, they don't go back to the same solution. They have to choose one of those. At least that's my understanding of, of the literature on that. So, um, 
what we see, uh, you know, in a sense, I'm kind of saying like McLean, well, we reached some pinnacle. No, we haven't reached a pinnacle. We are a, a, a branch of another branch on a twig of a twig somewhere way out there and in, in, on a tree of life. Um, and we're not necessarily, you know, the most recent or certainly not the best. We, we've done a lot of good stuff with our cognition and our consciousness, but we've also kind of screwed up the world quite a bit as well for ourselves and others. So, I'm not saying that just because we have these abilities that other mammals don't have, that we are better than them. We're just different. We like our differences because they're ours, but they're just differences. And again, they haven't necessarily always been good differences. Uh, but anyway, so we, um, uh, where were we? <laughs> well, so, so if cognition is the ability right. to represent things in the absence of the stimulus being there, right? So I can, yeah. I can look at something and perceive it in real time. I can also close my eyes and continue imagining it. Right. That's more or less what we mean when we, when we say cognition in, in your framework, what That's then right. is emotion? How do you think about what emotion actually is? Okay. So, you know, emotion, the typical view of emotions is that you have these basic emotions that we've inherited from other animals. And then we have these more um, you know, high order secondary emotions, you know, uh, empathy and jealousy and so forth that, that uh, weren't necessarily inherited from other animals, but are kind of human social constructions and so forth. Um, and for a long time, my work was used to, and still is used to support this basic emotions idea so that the amygdala is detecting danger and responding to danger. And therefore is a kind of what the basic emotions theorist would call a kind of, um, <clears throat> what do they call it? Like an affect program, a system that, that is sensitive to certain environmental stimuli and response. But there are two kinds of basic emotions theories. One is about the responses. A lot of the, the kind of Ekman work is about facial expressions, Paul Ekman, uh, about facial expressions, innate responses to so-called innate responses to specific kinds of key stimuli in the environment that, about danger and, you know, uh, other, uh, other things, um, anger and so forth. Um, but the, um, uh, the other kind of basic emotions theory is that these affect programs are also responsible for our subjective conscious experiences. And that is where the amygdala fear center idea comes in. Uh, I was, you know, I had always talked about my work. I tried to talk about my work in terms of the amygdala being an unconscious detector of danger. Um, I came at this from cognitive science uh, rather than neurobiology. And I was a newcomer to the field, so I adopted the language of the field. I was borrowing the, the procedure of Pavlovian fear conditioning, and so I called it fear conditioning. But what I tried to do was borrow a terminology from memory to say that, well, it's, uh, it's implicit fear conditioning, just as we have implicit memory and explicit memory, implicit being unconscious, explicit being conscious. The amygdala was involved in implicit memory or implicit fear, and the uh, uh, hippocampus and prefrontal cortex more an explicit uh, fear, especially the prefrontal cortex. Um, that the the idea was that the conscious experience of fear in us and perhaps other animals, some other animals, is the cognitive interpretation of a situation in which we find ourselves, a mental model of a situation. Now, where did I get this idea? Well. It started when I was a graduate student working with Mike Zaniga in the 1970s. So Mike and I were studying split brain patients. These are people in whom the two hemispheres, the connections between the two hemispheres have been split uh, section uh, to help control the spread of seizures from one side of the brain to the other. And control, because these, these people were, uh, had very severe epilepsy that wasn't being helped by medications. So, um, and this was a very, obviously, a, a very serious decision for a family to make, uh, to choose to do this, um, but they felt desperate and that there were no other options at the time, because this was you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, 50 years ago, and the medications were not uh, uh, working for everyone. I don't know how well they work today. I'm kind of not out of that field now. Um, but the... Um, uh, they were fascinating patients because the the classic idea is that our finding is that in the left hemisphere of a split brain patient you have language so the person can talk about what it or the left hemisphere can talk about what it sees and um, what it what it thinks and so forth whereas the right hemisphere doesn't have language so it can only respond to the world 
So in terms of the, uh, uh, well, so the right hemisphere doesn't have language, it, uh, so it, it can't answer questions, but it can respond to the world. So you know that it's alive and responsive, but you just don't know what's in there. But there was a patient in, in the group of people that we were studying. Uh, this, this was a new group of patients that were being operated on at Dartmouth. The other patients had been operated on in California, where Mike uh, uh, was studying them as a student himself. But in the Dartmouth group, we had this one patient who could read in both hemispheres, but still could only talk in the left. In the left. So this seemed to be the opportunity to really ask the question, uh, could you have two conscious minds, one in each hemisphere? So Mike had written a paper called One Brain, Two Minds, kind of speculating about that. But with the right hemisphere being unable to talk and communicate with you in a kind of meaningful way, it can just point to things and so forth. It was really hard to say that there was anyone home. Um, I mean, there was someone home and something was home in the sense of being behaviorally responsive, but, you know, every animal uh, alive is behaviorally responsive. So, um, we said, well, let's look at what, what we can do with the ability of the right hemisphere to read. So, we put some words into the left visual field. Left visual field means it goes to the right hemisphere, but you have to make sure the guy's staring at a dot on the screen so he doesn't move his eyes, otherwise it would go to both hemispheres. So. Staring at a dot um, in the right hemisphere, we put, who are you? And we placed a bunch of Scrabble letters on the table in front of them. And left hand, right hemisphere controls the left hand, pulls out P-A-U-L, spells his name. Okay. This is definitely someone home there because he knows his name. And what's the hallmark of consciousness? The ability to anticipate the future, to anticipate your own personal future. So, we asked him, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? Grow up. And he spelled out um, race car driver. Hmm. And we, from a conversation with the left hemisphere, he'd always said he wanted to be a draftsman, an architect. <laughs> so here we have two sides of the brain with the same name, but different life ambitions. So it was kind of a fascinating thing. Now, is that, you know, did that, did we really nail down the problem there? I don't know. I mean, it was, these are just observations. You've got one patient. And you go as far as you can with it. But it was the basis for my and Mike's uh, kind of future careers in a way, because uh, Mike went on to develop the idea of the left hemisphere interpreter as being this thing, left hemisphere interpreter is the, the basis of human consciousness. Um, but um, um, let me backtrack for a second and say what had happened. So after we, we observed this patient, that day, we would all, you know, after the day's work, we'd go to the bar at night and talk about what we had found. Uh, and we were talking about this guy, Paul, and um, how he, when, when we did an experiment that I haven't mentioned yet, but we would um, um, present a stimulus to the right hemisphere that would cause him to perform a response. Mm -hmm. So, like stand up or um, scratch uh, or something like that, and uh, or wave. Yeah. You know? So, when we did, when we t get him to get the right hemisphere to do those things, we'd ask the left hemisphere, "Why did you do that?" And without batting an eye, you know, without missing a beat, just instantaneously, when we when we said uh, uh, stand up, and the right hemisphere stood up, we said, "Why did you do that?" He said. I had to stretch. I was really tired sitting here. When the right hemisphere, I guess, left hand scratching the right hand, I said, why'd you do that? Well, I had an itch. Why'd you laugh? You guys are funny. You know, so he was just like narrating a story based on his behavior. And so at the bar that I was saying, you know, maybe that's what we do. I think probably Mike saying that. I was just you know, a very young, naive student. I had two degrees in marketing and joined Mike's <laughs> lab because I was wild about what he was doing and he took me. But anyway, so um, we said, maybe that's what we do all the time. We just, you know, confabulating, generating narratives to explain why we do and what we, why we uh, do what we do and what we do. Uh, Mike was a good friend at the time with Stanley Schachter, a social psychologist at um, uh, Columbia. And with Leon Festinger, another social psychologist at the New School uh, up the street in New York. And um, he, um, from these two guys, from, from um, 
Festinger, he got the idea of cognitive dissonance. I and mean, this is a very popular idea in mm -hmm. psychology, right? That when you do something that doesn't sit right, you have to justify it in some way. So when, you know, we all believe we have free will, right? So we, if our, if our body is producing a response, behaving in a way that our brain, our conscious brain didn't produce, that's disturbing because why did I do that? I have free will. That's what we are, some, what's going on? Why am I doing it? Well, Paul showed us that what we do is we just kind of explain it away. Uh, oh, I needed to stretch. Why'd you cheat on your wife? Well, you know, she wasn't that nice to me. Why'd you uh, eat that dessert? You're going to get fat. Well, you know, one time won't matter. You know, we, we narrate these stories to ourselves. And also at the bar, we, uh, Mike said, you know, there's not much research on emotion. And, you know, maybe those are the kinds of processes that are going to be generating these behaviors unconsciously that, uh, that we have to explain to ourselves and to others. And so I said, yeah, that, you know, I'm pretty interested in emotion. And so that's, I just said, well, I'm going to turn my work, you know, when you leave split brain research that your mentor is sponsoring, you don't have another group of patients you're going to be able to study, right? Because there's so few of these. So I had to find something else. So I decided to turn to rats to study how rats might unconsciously control behavioral and physiological responses to danger um, uh, because we've inherited these same circuits that control behavioral and physiological responses to danger uh, from animals like rats, not necessarily rats, but other animals that are in our direct past. So I turned to rodent studies of Pavlovian fear conditioning. And because I was a newcomer, I just called it fear, even though my idea was that emotions which we got from Stanley Schachter, the other guy that I mentioned up there, uh, who is uh, also a friend of Fessinger's. Schachter's theory was that uh, emotions are cognitive interpretations of situations. I won't go into the details of his experiments, but he had some evidence for that. And so we, we bought these two kinds of social psychology concepts and brought them into our interpretations of, of what was going on. Um, and so I, uh, I decided that... Um, um, the way I want to think about this is that these emotions that we uh, often will associate with these hardwired responses are not necessarily hardwired responses. Emotions are cognitive interpretations of situations. I've said that throughout my career. I can't say I never said that the amygdala is a fear center. I probably did, and you can find it somewhere. But don't hang me for that because, uh, as John Lennon said, uh, what did he say? Um, I, don't know, I forget. <laughs> uh, nothing to get hung, as John Lennon said. Nothing to get hung about. You know, we all make mistakes, and um, this, he was talking about smoking cigarettes in strawberry fields or something like that. Uh, so, um, anyway, so my view all along has been that emotions are cognitive interpretations of situations. But I'd get introduced at lectures as someone who discovered how the amygdala underlies our feelings of fear, and I really never. You know, I didn't never, I never really accepted, I never really bought that idea. Um, but um, when I was new to the field, I didn't care. I was young and just doing research and just kind of collecting data. But after a while, 2012, we'd been doing this for, I don't know, for 15 years or so, maybe longer. Um, it was like this itch that I needed to scratch, you know, because mm. it was just bugging me that I would be introduced this way because it's not what I thought. Uh, and I, I had decided I had to do something about it. So I wrote a paper uh, and published it in Neuron called Rethinking the Emotional Brain. The Emotional Brain was my first book. And so I'm now, I said, now I'm rethinking all this stuff that was in there. Even though I had talked about emotions as cognitive processes there, uh, there were other things I needed to like, I wanted to just rethink the whole process of how emotions come out of the brain uh, because the emotional brain was responsible for a lot of the pop psychology that came to underlie the amygdala and so forth. So um, I just, I decided to call these circuits like the amygdala circuit, uh, not fear circuits, but defensive uh, response, defensive uh, survival circuits. And the idea that I had was these go back far in evolution. You know, certainly all vertebrates have these defensive survival circuits. Other animals that are non-vertebrates don't have an amygdala, but they have their own survival circuits. Uh, flies, for example, were freeze to danger in the work of David Anderson, uh, Caltech. Um, so flies freeze 
but they don't have an amygdala, but they have their own kind of circuit that takes the stimulus and, and uh, connects it to the freezing behavior. Um, um, but what about animals that don't have nervous systems? Like not animal, what, what about organisms that don't have nervous systems, uh, protozoa and, and uh, bacteria and so forth? Well, they also have to detect and respond to danger, but uh, not with a nervous system. They use whatever mechanisms they have to for their cell wall to detect nutrients and detect uh, toxins and respond appropriately, withdraw or proceed. Um, and so that's why I say danger is as old as life. Um, and you know, it's often said, starting with Darwin and on into the basic emotions theorists, that fear and other basic emotions are uh, universal and, and spread around the world. But I think that's wrong. What's universal is danger. Mm. Every culture has some kind of danger. You know, it's, it's an, every organism is, is exposed to danger. Um, and so every culture has a word for danger. And we can, and we can translate those words into English words like fear um, very easily. So because we can translate fear across cultures, into uh, the same thing, we assume that the same experience is occurring, right? But we know that emotions differ culturally, that different cultures uh, have the same words, but the experience of the emotion in different cultures is different. So in the case of fear, it's danger that is universal, not fear. In the same, I think that's true of all so-called basic emotions. It's not the subjective experience that's the same. It's the eliciting conditions of life that are the same. I see. So, so putting some of these things together, you know, if we think about conscious, consciously experienced emotion as a, a kind of interpretation, a cognitive thing that's happening after some, some stimulus elicits a response, right? So you see something that we, we call a fearful stimulus or some kind of danger, you know, your pupils dilate, your blood, your blood pressure and your heart rate change and so on and so forth. The emotional experience we have, if I'm hearing you right, is some kind of cognitive interpretation of those physiological changes that happens after the fact. And it's sort of evocative of what you were talking about in those classic split brain patients where, you know, you ask them why they did something and they just confabulate a story, the, the, the narrative part of the brain, whatever that is, is just making something up after the fact. And it's sort of interesting that's happening after the fact. And so I'm wondering, you know, if, if this part of what the brain is doing, this, this emotion thing, this cognitive act, this cognitive interpretation of, of physiological changes is happening after the fact, it's not strictly necessary for the a lot of the behavioral response. It's not strictly necessary for all of that. So how do you start to think about the adaptive purpose of conscious emotions? What, what adaptive value in evolutionary terms did being able to tell those stories actually grant us? Yeah, well, thanks for asking that. I think it's a really important question. So <clears throat> in terms of the, the separation of the response, so let's take a rat that's responding to a tone that's been paired with a shock. So early on in my career, I showed that the Inputs to the amygdala that underlie that kind of response um, are come from the um, auditory thalamus rather than the auditory cortex. Mm -hmm. So you can activate the amygdala directly from the thalamus, which is you know the station before the cortex, um, and start responding. You know, and what I said at the time was you know we we react to danger before we know what we're reacting to before we're, we're afraid. So fear is the, is a slower cognitive process, and you know in a sense it it's it's only natural that it would be slower because. Um, it's a, you know, the, the energy, the brain energy required to build up, to create a mental model of a situation and to narrate it and to spin out the conscious experience is going to quite, be quite energy demanding. So you're not going to do that all the time. If you can do that with unconscious processes or non-conscious cognitive processes or completely unconscious processes that are automatically elicited like freezing, that's the best thing to do. That means let evolution do the talking for you or do the thinking for you at first. And then, you know, you, because, and, and then you can't help but do that because they just come out so fast, these automatic responses. So when that's coming out, you then see what's happening um, and you, you uh, begin to respond to that. So your behavior again becomes part of the cognitive mental model that you're assembling, uh, but not the only part because the mental model is uh, assembled in, in 
large part, I would say, on the basis of schema. These are men, memory structures about specific kinds of things and situations that have been built over the course of your life. You know, Piaget talked about this and Frederick Bartlett talked about schema in the 1920s and 30s. Um, and so schema are these, you know, just bundles of memories about kinds of situations. So when you're at work, you call on a work schema. When you're at, uh, at a party, you call on a party schema because you act differently than you do at work and party. You don't have to think about it. The schema activate the, you know, the schema create the, the mental part and and also the scripts, the, the kind of behavioral outputs that you are most likely to be expressing in a situation like that. Um, so anyway, so you've got the, the schema that are um, building up the model of the situation. These come into the uh, prefrontal cortex by way of the hippocampus and into the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, uh, and where um, the schema are, are uh, the hippocampus and medial pre ventromedial are, are communicating as the situation changes, and so the schema will change. But the ventromedial outputs go to the lateral prefrontal cortex, where the cognitive mental model is being assembled. And within that model is not only the schema, but also specific stimulus information, other kinds of memories, body feedback, um, your goals and aspirations, your hopes and dreams, all of that comes into the mental model. Um, and, then, <clears throat> and then the output of the mental model, and this is in, in my so-called model of how this works, is the narrative. So a narrative in this sense is a kind of abstract, it's not, a, it's not language, it's an abstract code that comes out of the mental model and controls behavior, including speech, and also populates a conscious mental model. And the conscious mental model then can also control behavior and speech, but separately from the unconscious one. So uh, the why, well, that's the purpose of consciousness. It's not just to have the experience, but that it's adaptive. It opens up another level of decision-making for you that you don't have if you're st strictly responding unconsciously. An unconscious mental model is good. And again, it's, it's less energy demanding than a conscious one. So that's your kind of go-to process. But if in the process, the, the, the unconscious process of going through that, something triggers uh, something is triggered that doesn't feel quite right, that's what will signal the uh, the generation of the conscious mental model. So earlier we talked about this kind of deep learning in the brain that is kind of just always accumulating information and allowing you to know that it's your body and your mind that's involved. So the idea is that the um, one of the things that would be important in the triggering of the conscious mental model is that so-called what psychologists call the feeling of rightness William James kind of started, they started everything, but the feeling of rightness that uh, occurs when everything is right. But when something is a little off, you get this, you know, a violation of that rightness, and that triggers something else. And that triggering is the, what justifies the use of, of the energy required to make the conscious mental model. And um, so what's interesting is how all of this works in the human brain. Because I think if we knew more about how it works in the human brain, uh, what are the, the areas and interactions between areas involved in human consciousness, we would be able to speculate, given what we know about what our brain is doing, what other brains, what the brains of other animals might do, given the similarities and differences with our brain. And so I used I like the uh, a partition of consciousness that Endel Tolving created uh, some time ago, which is between autonoetic or self-reflective consciousness. Uh, Tolving and, and many others believe this is perhaps a kind of human, or at least um, you know human chimpanzee kind of uh, ape kind of uh, we we are apes, so we can call it kind of an ape consciousness that is able to internally represent oneself as the agent. I mean, we don't, we can't prove that apes have this, but they seem to have all of the, they have enough of the kind of stuff we have to, that they probably have something like that. Um, so the self-reflective consciousness would be limited in evolution, um, whereas noetic consciousness is 
uh, knowledge of facts and semantic knowledge of facts and concepts. So you have a conceptual representation of the world um, that is very, you know, elaborate if you're a monkey, um, but you may not be able to take that next step that requires um, uh, the the reflective self that, that leads to the reflective self-awareness because your brain is, while quite similar to ours, it's not the same. Um, and what about other mammals? Well, the third kind of consciousness is no anoetic. The third kind of consciousness is anoetic consciousness. Now, this was puzzling to me for a long time because Tolving called this non-knowing awareness based on non-knowing knowledge. What the hell is that? And, you know, I thought, you know, this, I, I can't buy this because, you know, it's unconscious conscious. And the psychologist, neuroscientist Jacques Panksepp used to talk about this kind of unconscious consciousness as well. And Jacques and I had a lot of disagreements about, um, uh, we frequently were just in, in, dis in we frequently were not in agreement about consciousness and, and emotions. Um, but I figured out that it's all about one thing. That our disagreement was totally about anoetic consciousness. Because as he said, and that I believe now, that that's what rats and other mat lower mammals, I'll we'll call them lower, but non-primate mammals have, is this anoetic consciousness. This ability to know that this is my body, this, these are my mental states, but without any kind of explicit awareness or explicit uh, acknowledgement of that. It's just that it's there. Mm -hmm. And when it's not there, then, you know, it, something is triggered. Now, Panksa said that that was all subcortical limbic stuff that was responsible for that. Um, but I think that it has to be re-represented cognitively, just as the amygdala has to be re-represented cognitively in order to have the fear, right? Mm -hmm. So, the idea is that we have these, let's say, let's just take um, the deep learning systems of a rat subcortical brain um, that it's, it's acquiring all, let's just say of the rat brain because it's unconscious stuff throughout the brain. So the, the deep learning in this rat brain is acquiring information about the environment, what is the normal, you know, I won't say what feels right, but what is uh, normal, typical, uh, and what is not typical. And so even through some kind of, you know, expectation violation mechanism that we hear a lot about in neuroscience, you know, predictive coding and errors and all that stuff, you, got, you get something that violates an expectation that triggers something. So if all this deep learning stuff is hunky-dory, and then all of a sudden something violates the expectation of hunky-doriness, then that triggers something else. And what that triggers is a re-representation of that information in ventromedial prefrontal cortex and other kind of um, more um, the primitive uh, prefrontal areas like the uh, prelimbic cortex in a rat, for example, is supposed to be their working memory area and so forth. So this would allow the animal to now have a kind of higher order representation. But if you're a monkey instead of a rat, you can take that representation and re-represent it cognitively through their lateral prefrontal cortex, this granular prefrontal cortex that monkeys have, but that rats don't have. And that gives you a highly conceptualized information about the violation of that goodness, that uh, uh, hunky doriness of the deep learning. And if you're a human, you can also put that into a very personal uh, kind of self-reflective way that allows you to, what Tolving called, have mental time travel, the ability to project yourself into the past. Now, John Locke long ago said, how do I know that the me that I am today is the same me I was, you know, when I was young? He said, well, it's because you have the memory of yourself as young. And he didn't know about autonoidic consciousness and self-reflection and all of them. I guess he knew about self-reflection, but, but Tolving's autonoidic consciousness is what it, that is. It allows you to go to yourself in the past and to make decisions about who you were in the past, but also to allow you to be in the present as you. And importantly, to 
visit the future, to have the mental model that goes not just to the past, but to the future, where you can explore the opportunities based on what happened in the past, based on what you know now, but also based simply on creativity, the ability in the mental model to use language and to use all of the things we have to explore opportunities for deciding and acting that uh, monkeys and rats simply don't have because they don't have the kinds of brains we have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we, let's just take, I'm going to say, give you an anatomical hypothesis about these three kinds of consciousness. And it's not necessarily meant to be factual uh, in the sense that this is actually how it works, but it's an example of if it were like this, it would allow us to say, it, you know, this is a clear distinction that allows us to say, if monkeys and rats don't have this kind of cortex, they probably can't have this kind of consciousness. If rats don't have this kind of cortex, they probably can't have the kind of consciousness that monkeys have, so forth. So, um, this was all talked about in an article in uh, Current Biology that I published in 2021 called What Emotions Might Be Like in Other Mammals, Other Animals. So, there's a part of the prefrontal cortex called the frontal pole. And the frontal pole wraps around from the lateral surface to the medial surface. Uh, and it's all granular cortex. Most of the medial surface is not granular, but the frontal pole is a granular represent representation that goes into the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, but in the lat and monkeys have that, and and uh, humans have that, but rats don't have it. Now, the lateral frontal pole has a part, a component, in the human brain that even monkeys and chimpanzees don't seem to have. So let's say that that lateral frontal pole specialization, well, it's unique molecular, uh, uh, not just anatomical, but molecular and genetic specializations that aren't present in the other animals. Let's say that is, you know, what gives us that extra stuff that underlies our so-called, um, you know, autonoetic consciousness, mental time travel, and blah, blah, blah. And there is some evidence that, you know, subjective metacognition, the ability to change your mind involves the frontal pole, but it's it's more medial frontal pole. So, but, it's, but let's just say it's lateral for the sake of this argument. Um, that that So, because monkeys don't have that, then they can't have what that structure makes for us. And, um, but monkeys do have very well-developed, sophisticated uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex for working memory. And that is where we create our working memory models. And the working memory circuits in, rat, uh, in uh, monkeys and humans are quite, quite similar. Um, now, what about other mammals? Well, they have all those medial prefrontal areas that are non-granular um, and that can do all the things that our medial prefrontal areas can do, but in a you know, kind of not so souped up way. So the idea would be that if our medial prefrontal cortex is responsible for anoetic awareness and our dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex for noetic awareness, conceptual and semantic awareness, and our frontal pole for autonoetic awareness, then we would be able to speculate about what other animals, what other primates have, and what other mammals have that's similar and different to ours. That's the basic idea. And again, it's not that those necessarily are correct, but they're just kind of a model of what, if we knew more, this is what we could talk about. Mm -hmm. So the what? interesting... One of the things, just to try and summarize some of what you were saying that I found fascinating was, you know, when you were talking about what we might just call basic awareness or, or what seemed to be a contradiction in terms like non-conscious conscious, conscious yeah. awareness that other animals might have, that reminded me a lot of when people talk about things like flow states that we've all mm. probably experienced at some point, right? Where you're having perceptions, you're, you're aware, you're aware of what's going on, but everything just sort of seems to be flowing like one uh -huh. domino after another. And you're not right. sort of engaged in this narrative deliberation um, right. that humans are also capable of. And what's interesting about that is a such states are possible. It's possible to be aware without sort of those narrative deliberative forms of cognition happening. And people often experience these to be very, you know, pleasurable or peak experiences that, that are good to have. Now, on the other hand, based on what you were saying, our ability to, 
re-represent things, to go beyond the sensory representation itself and to re-represent that as a more abstract uh, representation in our minds, that opens the space of possibilities with respect to problem solving. So, so without that, we couldn't solve as many kinds of problems as we can solve as humans. And what's interesting about this, I think, is that this would appear to be a, sort of a blessing and a curse. This ability to get to go into abstract re-representations allows us to figure out things we couldn't figure out and that other animals can't, but it would seem to be also just the thing that opens us up to certain forms of mental illness, like, like the forms of depression or anxiety we have, which are, if you think about it, they are sort of, they're wrapped up in this ability to do mental time travel and get stuck in the past and be depressed about it or be anticipating the future in a way that makes us persistently anxious. Is that a reasonable way to think about it? Absolutely. You know, Kierkegaard said that uh, anxiety is the price we pay for freedom. And he was talking about Adam choosing, uh, you know, the apple uh, in, in the Garden of Eden. But um, uh, one, another way to talk about that is the um, um, that the um, anxiety is the price we pay for having a prefrontal cortex that can anticipate the future and worry about it. Interesting. Interesting. One last thing I would love to ask you about while you're here and because I'm talking to you is, is to do with the question of memory. And a couple of things are, are interesting about memory with respect to humans and certain other animals. One, we have very good memories in the sense that we can form many memories that are very durable over very long periods of time. But also, as your work has shown over the years, memory is more labile and plastic than we often recognize as we're going about our day-to-day -day lives. And in fact, I think your work has shown that potentially every single time that we recall a memory, there is a kind of reconsolidation process that happens. And those memories are not static and fixed and reliable. They're actually changing over time. And so what is the sort of plasticity of of memory start to tell us about uh, how trustworthy our, our thoughts and our, our narrative structures that we tell ourselves actually are. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, um, there's this thing, um, well, I don't, I don't want to go that way. Um, <clears throat> re reconsolidation was um, something that had been kicking around in the field and kind of suppressed for a long time since I think probably since the 1960s. And then in 2000, um, a really bright postdoc in my lab, uh, Kareem Nader decided that he wanted to, you know, he found about, out about this and said, hey, we got to study this. I said, no, nah, that'll never work. And the idea that we had just, what we, we had just published a paper show, let me start over. So reconsolidation work in my lab uh, came out of the work of Kareem Nader, a very bright postdoc uh, at the time, still a right, very bright person, um, who had looked into some older literature and found that there, was, there were studies showing that if you lock protein synthesis, um, sorry, one more time, sort of. Reconsolidation work in my lab uh, was the work of Kareem Nader, who was a very, very bright uh, postdoc and working with me. And he was looking into some older research. Um, we had just done an experiment where we put protein synthesis inhibitors in the amygdala. Uh, I'm, okay, I got to do this one more time. Sorry. What, what time? Was it? You're it's at 927 right now. Okay, yeah, we can go to uh, like 45, if you okay. another, another 15. So, so reconsolidation in my lab started as a kind of uh, byproduct of our work on consolidation. Consolidation is the process of stabilizing memories after their form. So one of the classic findings in the field was that if you block protein synthesis after the formation of a memory, um, shortly after the formation of the memory, after learning, then that memory is not stored in a long-term sense. Um, so the idea was that these the proteins that would be made um, are not there, and those proteins would be involved in the conversion of short-term to long-term memory. But when they, excuse me, the idea was that the if the proteins that are involved in the conversion of short-term to long-term memory are blocked, then long-term memory can't be formed. Now, Kareem Nader in my lab um, 
was interested in in this work that Glenn Schaaf and I had done uh, on on consolidation, and he was looking into this and came across this older literature in the 1960s and 70s that showed that not only if you block protein synthesis after learning do you lose long-term memory, but also if you block protein synthesis after the retrieval or the remembering of a memory, you block you prevent long-term memory the next time. So, you know, Kareem walked into my lab, to my office and said, hey, Joe, I want to I want to study reconsolidation. I said, I don't know. What, what is that? And he explained. I said, that'll never work. So, he left. A month later, he comes back. He said, I got it. I said, what'd you get? He said, well, I, I showed that if we block uh, protein synthesis in the amygdala after the retrieval of, of fear conditioning in the rats, then the rats don't freeze anymore to the tone. Oh, and they don't freeze the next day. You know, it's like you need protein synthesis, not just to learn and, and create a long-term memory, but also to restore the memory after it's been taken out. The idea is that when you take it out, it becomes unstable. And that means you have the opportunity to add new information, good information, positive, you know, support the memory, but also to change the memory in ways that aren't necessarily uh, useful. You can like uh, erase the so-called erase the memory. Now, the whole memory erasure thing kind of got blown up and way out of hand. The whole idea that we could take these findings in rats and transfer them to humans and we'd be able to cure PTSD with uh, by blocking, uh, uh, by preventing this reconsolidation process from taking place. It never really fully panned out. And part of the problem is that we were studying a very simple kind of behavior in rats, tone paired with shock. That's one of these, you know, Pavlovian conditioned reactions that don't require any thought or consciousness or anything like that. It's just like automatic. But in PTSD, the whole problem is all the cognitive and the thought processes mm. and the rumination. And so it, there's no way that you can take a complex memory. It's really big and full of all sorts of stuff, represent some component that's related to that and away it's gone. Yeah? Um, so I think reconsolidation could potentially be used as a way to um, um, it blocked some of the behavioral and physiological responses that get conditioned during those steps, but not necessarily to change the memory. I mean, the good news that is, I mean, like George, President George Bush's uh, bioethics council came down hard on us when we suggested that, you know, we might be able to change human memory by doing this. Um, so we thought about it a lot and we kind of concluded, well, yeah, it's, it's really a different thing that human memory is a much more complicated thing. Um, and the good news is we did some experiments even in rats showing that if you make a more complex memory with lots of conditions, stimuli controlling the behavior and you extinguish one of them, you don't erase the whole process. You only kind of eliminate one part of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So the good news was that you might be able to chip away piece by piece at a complicated memory in the human brain. But I think even that is, you know, at this point uh, has not been clearly demonstrated. So it's still, mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's still possible that it could be useful, but um, like a lot of things that look really great and promising at first, it uh, didn't pan out to be as quite as powerful as we had hoped. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, connecting that to some of um, the thoughts you were giving us before about, you know, what a conscious, consciously experienced emotion is, is that you know, if, if the conscious experience of an emotion is some kind of cognitive operation, the kind of story we tell ourselves about the physiological response we have to a stimulus or to a memory, with connecting that to this idea of reconsolidation or the plasticity of memories, you know, if the hope was originally with reconsolidation, oh, we can go in and, you know, erase the traumatic memory of PTSD. Well, maybe you can't erase it, but you can change the way the person is, is sort of giving themselves a narrative about it. And that to me is very evocative of what we see with things like these clinical trials using MDMA for PTSD, where you hear the patients afterwards and their memory's not gone. They still remember the traumatic event, but their experience of the remembering of it is now very different in terms of its emotional valence. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the good news about the cognitive idea of uh, emotions and, and fear and anxiety and so forth is that if, a lot of it is the cognitive interpretation. That means you can, you know, reinterpret that. You can reappraise it and perhaps uh, um, do quite well with that. So I'm, I'm really 
kind of anti-drugs in terms of um, fear and anxiety, for example. So let's talk about how drugs are developed to mm. treat people. You take a rat or a mouse in a, at a drug company, you put it into Pavlovian conditioning or some other kind of uh, circuit that, depend, that uh, is a kind of defensive survival circuit, give the animal a drug that makes him freeze less or avoid less. Um, and you think, well, okay, because fear is the cause of freezing uh, in humans, then we, uh, if, if we make rats freeze less by this drug, it ought to make people feel less fear. But what has happened? Uh, well, the, the whole history of the pharmaceutical industry is kind of reversing. They're kind of saying, well, we're throwing our hands up. We can't find anything new that we didn't discover in the 60s, often accidentally. You know? um, and so, but the problem is that it, the conception of what fear is, I think, has been wrong. It's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the experiments. I mean, if you give the animals uh, in, in a, one of those experiments in a drug company, an SSRI, and it freezes less, uh, you give it to a person, if they freeze less, that's progress, right? Um, but, you know, instead, so the, the party line has been in, uh, in the industry and in in psychiatry that this is an anti-anxiety drug. You know, let's say take whatever anxiety drug you want to talk about. This is an anti-anxiety drug. It'll make you less anxious. Um, and you'll go to the party and you won't, you know, you'll be okay. Um, but what they, I think what they should have been saying is, well, this is a drug that will affect um, your physical symptoms. It will make you less jittery and less aroused, maybe less avoidant when you're about going to the party. Um, but you're anxious. You're an anxious person. You've been anxious all your life. You'll probably still be anxious at the party, but you can use the drug to moderate your symptoms, your physical symptoms, and become a little more comfortable uh, being at the party. And if you expose yourself this way with the drug in, on board, um, you, you know, you can perhaps begin to have a social life at, at parties like this, um, but not necessarily an anxious free social life. I mean, anxiety is part of life and um, uh, we all have it. So there's no fully eliminating it. It's just you have to learn to live with the amount of anxiety that uh, that you have and yet you experience at these parties. I see. And so, I mean, do you, do you feel like, um, do you feel like a lot of our standard anti-depression, anti-anxiety medications have been used and widely used for uh, reasons that are a bit misguided? Well, I think we've, the problem is we've just misunderstood what these things are. I mean, we've, we've so marginalized, you know, psychiatry and behaviorism and all of that was so anti-Freud um, that when behavioral therapies came along in the 50s and drug therapies were coming along in the 50s, the goal was to keep anything subjective out because that's what Freud was all about. But they threw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay, you can get rid of, you know, repression, you know, sexual abuse, repression, blah, 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 and other things that were uh, uh, and, uh, that, that Freud touted that were, you know, more doubtful. You can't have a psychiatry that ignores the subjective experience of the patient. Now, we just wrote a paper called um, Putting the Mental Back into Mental Disorders. And it's about how, you know, over the entire course of uh, since the, the 1950s, um, subjective experience has not been valued. You know, when I wrote a paper with a, a, a colleague on uh, these two systems for fear, like uh, that, that fear is the con cognitive part and the non-cognitive automatic amygdala part is separate, that, um, uh, that, that subjective experience needs to be part of the therapeutic goal, not just, you know, and the insurance companies just, you know, care about that. You know, it's about metrics. Get the, what can, you got 10 or 12 things on a list. If you have three of those, then you have this. If you got three of, on another list, you have that, you know? So there are so many ways to have any one thing that it's, it's kind of, uh, it, it's about, you know, these symptoms. It's not about the experience. And if the person is treated and the, the, at the end of therapy, they don't feel better then the therapy hasn't been a success. You've got to somehow address the, the, the subjective experience. Now I think every therapist implicitly does that, 
but it's not part of the the, the uh, you know the the checklist. It's not part of the not a central part. It should be the number one thing, and all that other stuff is supporting and making it harder to have a. a a subjective experience that's comfortable for you. Uh, and so we have to kind of reverse that whole decades and decades of the way we think about what these things are. Well, Joseph Ledoux, I want to thank you for your time. I've always been a big fan of your work. Do you want to mention just one last time for people what, what your last book was and, and leave people with any final thoughts you have? Sure. The last book uh, that I published was called The Deep History of Ourselves, The Four Billion Year Story of How We Got Conscious Brains. And, um, you know, one thing I think that um, I left out of the discussion earlier, if I could just pop that in as a, an afterthought, um, when we were talking about anoetic, noetic, and autonoetic consciousness. Um, in humans, as Jacques Panks Pank said, and I, I totally agree, um, these autonoetic states and noetic state, well, autonoetic state, in humans, autonoetic and noetic states, the explicit states with content overshadow these anoetic states that are more subtle and just kind of there in the background. But in rats and other lower mammals, non-primate mammals, that's all they have is these anoetic states. And so that's why he would talk about these kinds of unconscious conscious emotions in rats. But everybody thought he was talking about real fear, our fear. And that animal fear and our fear was the same. And that's you know how the whole problem comes up. But that's not what he was saying, even though he kind of said that in public. So it's a little confusing. But it's important to remember that anoetic is there all the time. If you can have noetic, you have noetic and anoetic, but the noetic will overshadow the, the anoetic. And if you can have autonoetic, it will overshadow everything else. But every, no, every autonoetic state, every explicit self-reflective state, includes conceptual and semantic knowledge, factual knowledge about who you are and all of the stuff you know, uh, and also this anoetic feeling of rightness or wrongness that is there or not there. Um, but those you know, fall into the background of the autonoetic self-reflective experience. That is what you can't, that's what counts when you are in a, a situation where it is you that is uh, having the experience. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me a lot about, you know, the, the meditation literature. So to use the language that you were using, you know, a lot of the, the meditation people and meditation practitioners sort of are basically saying that the point of the practice is to um, let the noetic and autonoetic operations of the brain calm down and wind down. And if you achieve that, then the anoetic stuff becomes much more visible because it is so subtle. Right. You know, I, I think uh, one of my books, I, I forget which one, um, but I said that meditation might be the use of working memory. Usually we use working memory to select information, pull it into working memory, right? But meditation may be used to like select information and shut it out of working memory um, and to allow then those anoetic states to, to rise up and flow as you were talking about. Well, I think that's a great spot to end it. Professor Joseph Ledoux, thank you for your time. Thank you. It's been fun.